Hello, podcasting world, and welcome back to another episode of the Core Consult RX Podcast. My name is Mike Corvino. Right over here to my right, your left, Cole Swanson, and we have a special guest with us today, Dr. John Tyrell. John, what is up? Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Good to finally make it. Glad to have you here. Yes. So, John uh, had the just amazing privilege and, and honestly an honor to graduate with me. <laughs> So he was in my class, so we're, we're buds from back in the day, and uh, I'm going to start off, if you're cool with this, John, and kind of going through like some of your background. So we graduated in when? 2015? 15. Yes, 15. Yeah. You'd think I could remember that from three years ago. Right. Um, so 2015, what have you been doing since then? What was your post-graduation plans? Or uh, Well, my plans were actually very much foiled. I uh, was on the residency track, and didn't match back then there was only one match and then a scramble didn't scramble so I uh, didn't have any plans not really a backup plan because that's not kind of how you go at things and uh, through some back channels and other connections and stuff I was able to get a job as a clinical pharmacist at a uh, community hospital and um, I've been practicing as a clinical pharmacist uh, ever since so that's you know almost three years now Awesome. What type of setting? What type of patients? Uh, all over. I, I cover the ED, ICU, uh, cardiology patients that are post-cath. Um, also a hospitalist team, distributive, managerial policies, uh, protocols. Do it all because we're such a small facility. We get to, I think that's the benefit of being at a smaller hospital. Yeah. So, yeah, I took that experience. Uh, also been uh, taking students from uh, MUSC and, um, yeah, precepting them. Got into uh, doing a little bit with uh, teaching and mentoring mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, rolled that all together. Kind of like a build-your-own-residency type of thing. I still had that goal in mind. So uh, then I decided it was time re-entered the residency pool and uh, matched. Uh, so I'll be headed off to residency in July. Huh. Very cool. Yeah. That's awesome, man. So, you know, how did, how did it go about, like, when you first started applying for that very first clinical position, you know, you said it was a, a smaller hospital, but did they mention at all the fact that you hadn't had a residency, or how did you end up scoring that position? Um, I did a internship with Johns Hopkins Hospital, and – one of the people I had met there who was a resident at the time called me to wish me happy birthday, um, asked what I, I was doing. I said I was sitting on the beach, and they're like, no, no. <laughs> what are you doing with your life? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I don't sitting have a job. Sitting on the beach. <laughs> <You're all right. laughs> yeah, uh, it's my birthday. I'm sitting on the beach. Um, and, and she said, well, we have a job opening. I think you'd be great for it. I'll talk to my director. She did. She got right back to me and was like, go apply for the job. And I'm like, now like do i have to leave the beach yes okay. now go and, and then so, luckily for you, you had an iphone so you were right on there right there no i actually 4G. i actually drove the um you know two miles back home and uh <laughs> it's dedication <laughs> right i drove the two miles back home and got on the interwebs and uh <laughs> information super highway yeah yeah and and turned in my application and uh had my interview like within a week job within a month which is unheard of in hospital awesome. pharmacy especially yeah. going through all the hr loops and urine tests and background and all that so yeah anyway um it was just through a connection of something i was you know preparing to do for residency doing all those things just uh the networking kind of played in i i try to tell people that's not something you can count on those you know don't put too much into that networking but you know occasionally it, it definitely pans out it's about who you know sometimes yeah. and, sometimes and it's one of those things I'm, i kind of go a little bit different direction i actually say i used to dog on the the networking side of things a little bit but now just kind of the way my career has played out personally i feel like networking is almost i mean one of the most important things other than like work ethic yeah. because if you can combine those two things the work ethic helps with the networking because people you stand out because most people don't want to go above and beyond and, uh, you know, some people are, I would say most people, honestly, are okay with doing well but not killing themselves kind of thing through, through resi- you know, rotations or whatever it is and just busting their behind. 
And so when you do those things and you kind of stand out, people start to talk and take you know notice of you. And so, you know, f- in your position, like if you hadn't worked hard or you hadn't done well on rotation, that may have never actually happened for you. And who knows where you would have been, right? I mean, right. would you agree? Or Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, work ethic, I, I, I absolutely agree with you. If you don't have the work ethic, uh, you know, that that's what matters most to me when I see students. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, having a good base is great. But honestly, if we're all at this level, if you're in pharmacy school, m- you know, most everybody deserves to be there and can do the job of a pharmacist. Mm-hmm. You just need to have the drive and willingness to do it. Yeah, and there's two sides to the networking thing too. You can know as many people as you want, but if you're lazy and you're not a good right. practitioner, exactly. and that's, they're, they're not going to recommend they're know you, you too. So, right, and that's exactly <laughs> that. why I, you know, downplay the um, networking because I don't want people to think that's all they have to do. Right, sure. that's a very good point. That, yeah, but I agree with what you said. If I if say work have, eth- work ethic first networking second because it and it kind of falls right in line with the work ethic. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I was almost all networking when I was in school. <laughs> well, and you know, the other thing too is I hate that people because sometimes if you don't get a certain to a certain spot or a certain position, people will throw out the excuse of, "Oh, well, that person got it because they know somebody they know." Sure. So I've actually had people kind of throw that at me a little bit with, "Oh, you got that because you know somebody," but I'm like, "Well, do you think?" I'm the only healthcare professional in my entire family. I'm like, you think I know that person because I might, you know, somebody right. in my family introduced me or because I had, I came from, you know, whatever money or what privilege or whatever, you know, like none of that. So I had that network because I established that connection and when, you know, if it came for me at post-graduation kind of networking on my own, on my days off and I'm taking vacation days. I mean, that starts with that. And so, I mean, you can, right. it's super important, but you have to make the move and put in the work work ethic to actually go make those connections in the first place that's true that's so, very true i went to countless meetings as a student i definitely did not do enough of it as a student <laughs> i i didn't really get my kind of a moment of like clarity i guess you could say until afterwards so i wish i would have done more during during school i had to scramble towards the end to kind of i hit, I hit my stride in rotations fourth year is a great time to, to yeah. do that though you know yeah what, do, what about you Cole? do you feel like do you feel like you kind of did enough of it during school? Or do you feel like during rotations? Is when I you mean, in school, really I was mediocre. I went to meetings. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't like the front row guy who's talking to the preceptors after, I mean, the professors after every, mm-hmm. you know, class or anything. But yeah, most of the connections that I have now definitely came through fourth year or through um, interning at my regular job, yeah. you know, so, so pre-residency, now residency. Mm-hmm. So what's the plan going forward? Um, well, Doing the regular pharmacy practice, PGY-1. Um, we'll see where that takes me. I have an idea of what I want to do yeah. uh, for PGY-2. You want, you want to put it on record so we can say, look at it, he predicted his own future? <laughs> um, I do mo- it all the time, believe me. I'm, I'm going to be right like 20% of the time and I'll be happy. All right. Um, well, if I'm picking one, I, I always threw out two during interviews. Uh, if I'm picking one, I'm I'm aiming towards emergency medicine. Okay. Um, I think it's That's a fun. you know it's a not really emerging. It's already emerged, but it's a still growing area, and it has all aspects: uh, critical care, internal medicine, inpatient, outpatient, and my second favorite, which is infectious disease. There's plenty to do in mm-hmm. emergency as far as stewardship and recommendations and whatnot. So sure. That's right now where I'm. Um, focused but i uh, kind of want to see how pgy1 goes and you know i don't want to over specialize myself mm-hmm. um yeah because you like to have your hands in a lot of different stuff it seems like i mean i do we've had um, similar mindsets since graduation yeah i do um and that's why I, I love the job i have so um we'll just see how that goes and see where it takes me awesome the um as, as far as you know what made you finally decide to do the right i mean you already had a job that you love do you, do you feel like is this just to open up as more doors because it's a good time in your life to do it or what's kind of your mindset as far as making the choice um it, it's twofold i uh you know have not having the residency they you know they uh, a common idiom is that doing a pgy1 residency is the equivalent of about three years of practice well i've, I've practiced for about three years um, but I've been practicing at a smaller 
hospital where we don't have the acuity that you would see in a lot of the residency programs. So that's really what I wanted to go back and do is learn more. I didn't have the opportunity or didn't take the opportunity to do like a psych rotation. I never understood the importance of psych until I saw some of the things that were happening in, in the ED. And, uh, you know, and, and on the floor, to be honest. Uh, and so there, there's a lot of things like that that I, I don't see. We don't deal with a lot of kids where we are. We don't have a peds department. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So just more opportunity to see things, um, to honestly become a better pharmacist. Uh, they ask me all the time when I was at interviews, why are you doing this? And that's what I would say to be a better pharmacist, to be honest. And I mean, and it's a sacrifice because it's a, you know, it's a big, yeah. it's a big pay cut. Sure. And it's a chance because, you know, I'm taking a sabbatical from my job and who knows what will be available when I'm finished. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I, and that's, it's one of those things everybody's always worried. I think like, Oh, what if I take this opportunity, but then some, you know, I lose that. You're not going to ever know the alternative. So right. jump, go for it. That's yeah. And that's my you attitude know. always has that's been. a good, good call. So I think is the more doors you can open, if you can, if it makes sense in your life and you're not going to like sacrifice something that's too, you know, too big to take an opportunity. I mean, I think if it makes sense is, if something opens up more doors for you, awesome. Even right. if you never use them. Yeah. That's the, then that was the second reason was it, you know, I have built basically my dream job in that three years where I'm, you know, teaching and I have my hands in pretty much every aspect of inpatient pharmacy that I want to. Um, but if I were to, you know, pick up and move my families in Utah, if I wanted to go back to Utah and do that, it would, I would say virtually be impossible for me to do that. I don't have the connections that I did here in South Carolina Mm -hmm. and it would be, you know, very hard to pick up and do that. Um, you know, I've, I've seen that job market out there, um, when I was, you know, part time starting out, I still interviewed around and would always get passed over for people with tons of experience or that had residencies. You know, and so if you want to be in a big city or any kind of city, mm-hmm. I think you've got a lot of competition these days for inpatient work. So hypothetical situation, if you were going to move to a, a bigger city, mm-hmm. this is just more just to chit chat about it. But sure. if you're going to move to a big city, you didn't have a residency. How, what would your strategy be to get into one of those positions? Because most there's some people that will say it's not going to happen. You can't get a job, which I would kind of disagree with. I think there's always it may be a lot harder but you can get a job, in my opinion, in a clinical position even without one. Um, so what would your strategy be? Because I feel like we've, we've talked about this you know, off the record kind of thing, so I feel like we kind of agree on this. But what would your strategy be if just for, if anybody is at home kind of thinking like they, they just can't do a residency for whatever reason, yeah. um, what would you do? So uh, kind of what I did, I, you know, if, if you're in a city and you want to be in the city, that's going to be even more tough, but anything peripheral – um, you know, in a surrounding more community that's going to refer to that bigger city hospital. Um, there's a lot of affiliates of, you know, the big hospital here in Charleston. Mm -hmm. So I work for one of those and, you know, I would, I would basically do what you have to take the PRN job, do what you need to, to pay the bills, but do the PRN job, get the experience transition if you can. Um, and just keep working. I mean, yeah. keep your feet moving, keep moving forward and opportunities will open up, but you have to be receptive to them. If you're, you know, if you're stuck on, I've got to be in this absolute location and you can't move and you're not willing to, you know, put in the extra hours off the clock like that, we do all the time. That's the key. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't count how many hours off the clock I've done in the last three years. Just keep prepping. And that, and that would be the other thing. Keep studying. You're learning shouldn't stop in fact you should be getting better and better and you know if you are in a hospital position once you've worked the required number of years you could sit for the boards for like bcps sure i think you can sit for the bcps nowadays for pretty much any position you're sitting in uh, so they say like they give a list now because they've took away all the thousand hours and of this that and the other they Mm -hmm. just give like a list of but it looks, it's very, it's more broad than yeah. Is yeah, it, you would have thought it, it of when I looked ho- at it. Recently. You could justify, I feel like you could justify, I haven't personally tried it yet, right. but I'm going to try this year. Um, Applying. And, yeah. To, to take it um, yeah. because 
to me, I'm like, I think I would imagine they would, you know, not reject my $700 or whatever I'm going to say. And they would just assume that if I really wasn't prepared for it, I just wouldn't come anywhere near yeah. close to I mean, passing. And I think so. I'm available. I think we're eligible yeah, as this year. O- October, right? I think this you know, three year mark or whatever it is. Yeah. I think there's only two tests a year though. Yeah. Right. October. Yeah. I think is the most, yeah, the closest one. Um, well, cool. Good luck. Yeah. Now, we'll see. I mean, I mean, that's my plan anyway. We'll, we'll see. But, um, but they may be like, ah, no, dude, get out of here. No. Can't sit for it. You got to do a PG-01. So I'll have to get someone to forge me a piece well, of paper and all that. I mean, if you that, look so. at what they say, it's not a requirement. It's true. It's not. So. Yeah. You just have to have the three years and, I mean, whatever their equivalent experience right. is. Right. Yeah. And they're each diff- Each one of them is different. I know, having sat through some of the discussions on the PEDS. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I think that would be a much harder thing to get into but the regular bcps right like peds general, or yeah i think they, they would be a little bit more yeah. yeah yeah but i don't know i haven't done it's still a little bit too far out to do a ton of research on We've got too sure. much stuff going on yeah but no i agree and like and i also kind of just to add on a little bit but i actually think too something that people don't consider or don't want to do rather uh you know if you have that job that maybe it's pr and like you said or maybe it's a position you really don't want but it pays your bills and allows you to eat food which is always good um sometimes do do that but volunteer Mm -hmm. at the spot that you do want like people don't put enough effort i mean it's like you forget the whole i went when i was in school i was working for free but i made all these connections and got all these opportunities but it's like then when we get out and like years later it's like you get too fancy and like well i'm worth this much money right it's it's sometimes worth it to work for free and prove your worth and then if that's really really the job you want for sure right yeah there's i mean in cole you talked about that with a clinic before too like i'll just come in here and Hang out with you guys for yeah. a day a week or something. Yeah, yeah. It's I'll just, be a free pharmacist. You know, yeah. but who's going to say no to that? Exactly. And then once you prove your worth, then when you take the free pharmacist away, it gives you a little bit better play. Yeah. Right. But I, I mean, I think that can happen with any, not even just pharmacists, but just a lot of positions. You prove right. yourself. I think more doors will open. Make you, yeah, make yourself invaluable. And people don't want to have to do that part. They just want to be like, well, offer me a job and pay got, me exactly I what I want. Pay me exactly what I want. Also. <laughs> Do you guys have a car sign on bonus? <laughs> <laughs> uh, good stuff. Cool. Good cool, man. Well, that's uh, definitely going to be times. Gonna be cool to watch for the year. Um, it's we'll going to be it's going to be rough uh, going from your pharmacist salary down back down to a resident salary. It's going to hurt a little bit, but yeah. I've already started uh, practicing with some ramen noodles. With ramen noodles. Yeah. Ramen noodles. You can see a lot of stuff. You Put will... some cheese under it. Yeah. Cheese under it. Under it when you're yeah. boiling. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I've heard it's fascinating. Good. I've heard it's. I would never try that. But. <laughs> <laughs> I've tossed some garlic in there once yeah. in a while. I still eat ramen noodles now. I don't give a crap. Yeah, yeah, yeah me too. Yeah, the, sodium. Like, that's so all. Here's, the, here's the thing, though. I don't use a little packet of stuff. I eat them like a cracker, oh. like literally, yeah, like yeah. just a cracker, like because I'm too lazy to boil. I've heard of people. Are yeah, you one of those people? I'm totally one of those. People. No way. Because it's a quick twelve cent meal, and you don't have to cook it. <laughs> you Do just you have drink to... the water to no. let it expand, and no. You, you crunch ramen, I literally just crunch it like a, like a cracker, yeah. Hmm. You know, sometimes you can break it a piece. It comes in a little to-go bag. <laughs> You're all set. Meal. That's it's almost like one of those coaster rice waffle things. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what that is, but that sounds similar. About. Rice cake? Yeah. That looks like a coaster that you sell on the table. Uh, um, yes. I got you. It's just like that. Only, I, I only have not the words. as good for you. I'm, I'm good with the words. Yeah, you pantomimed it really well. <laughs> so that's good. Yeah, the thing that that's so great about this podcast is I mean, just so much good advice. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> college students, this is quality oh stuff. My gosh, you, you're not uh, going to get this anywhere else. Now, let me no. give you a pro tip since I'm here. Yeah, um, I can't wait. Yeah, one step up from ramen <laughs> is this thing called yakasoba. It comes with its own container. Oh, yeah, what they dropped the price, and I think they're about oh, eighty cents shoot. now. Um, no way. That extra, you know, sixty yeah. cents, you get a self-contained mm. bowl. No boiling, no dishes. But Amazing. is it biodegradable? Absolutely not. You can okay, just stack well, it up with your curry you know, cups. I'm a ramen man. I think I've tried that before. It's hard for me to. to you go ramen once, it's hard to go back. No, I I think this is. They have just the cups. As good. Oh no, not the cups. They I'm talking the about cups. that tray thing. I know. I've seen it. Okay. We're talking about the full tray the bowl. Full tray. I want a TV listen, dinner no. style tray. Don't listen. I. I know what I'm talking about with ramen. All right. Yeah, okay. This is good. I don't even remember what the heck this podcast is about anymore. Speaking of acid reflux. Yeah. Yeah. Great segue. Oh, my gosh. Nailed it. 
That was perfect. All right. Yeah, Cole, introduce us to the topic at hand. Yes, so we are actually going to talk about something medical today, uh, an acid reflux. So GERD, but also GER, uh, because it's not always GERD, believe it or not. So we all know what acid reflux is. You're going to have a patient that comes in and say, uh, man, I have this pain in my stomach. Always happens right after I eat, and it's right here in the middle. And they're not going to have any idea what it is, but you're going to know what it is. Um, And generally, the approach that people do is to give them a PPI if they haven't already started one over the counter. We're going to walk you through what the options are. There are other things other than PPIs. uh, And we'll talk about the appropriate use of PPIs and uh, maybe even some dangers associated with them as well. So they are indicated in certain situations, but not all the time, right? Not all the time. All right. Where do we want to start? So we can start with, so we talked a little bit about what acid reflux is um, and it's pretty common and it's kind of physiologic so people are going to have acid reflux postprandially uh, anyway sometimes it's short-lived sometimes it's even asymptomatic the biggest concern is if it's happening frequently uh, more than a couple of times a week or if it's happening at night while you're sleeping that's when we're like okay you might warrant some treatment or at least some lifestyle modifications right mm-hmm. so what are those so this is and this is an area that's kind of uh, interesting to me because, you know, originally the big thing, and, and I think the really the way that I learned it in school even, was you, looking for like trigger foods sure. and things like that, where everyone got put on this special diet that would avoid things like caffeine, chocolate, alcohol, um, onions, you know, pizza sauce type thing. Uh, but they've kind of done away, so the, the American College of Gastroenterology has kind of done away with saying that everyone should be on this modified diet, um, and it's more so patient-specific. They put a lot more emphasis now in weight loss, especially. Mm -hmm. Um, Seems to do wonders for getting rid of GERD, um, as well as all these other problems that we see in the U.S. health system. And uh, also uh, discontinuing nicotine use. Um, So patients that smoke, especially overweight patients that smoke, the double threat... So if we can get rid of two of those things, a lot of times uh, those symptoms will will be reduced just with doing that. Sure. And it's similar to hypertension, similar to prediabetes. When a patient comes in with acid reflux, uh, even if you diagnose them with GERD, you don't necessarily have to start a medication right there. So, you know, start with lifestyle th- uh, modification. Um, you mentioned the weight loss is the biggest thing, and I'm sure any provider is like, oh, weight loss, because, you know, that solves everything. It's really hard to get your patients to lose weight, uh, but I think it's important to have that conversation. Most of the time, people think, I don't really have time to really have a good motivational conversation about weight loss. Um, but if you think about it, even if you give them a prescription, there's time that goes into a prescription. Somebody's going to have to counsel them on the prescription. You're going to have to approve refills for the prescription. There's going to be questions about the prescription. There's concerns long-term with the prescription. So it might be worth taking a few minutes to really talk to them about weight loss and emphasizing the importance. Um, Another thing that's shown benefit, especially in the nocturnal acid reflux, elevating the head of the bed a little bit, they say. Um, A lot of ways you can do that. Put something on the front end of the legs, maybe a riser that you could get from, you know, the grocery store or, um, somewhere to get furniture, something like that. You could also put like a styrofoam um, plank under the pillows or even use extra pillows. Apparently that works pretty well. So something to consider. And even though they've kind of gone away from just recommending this uh, low acid reflux diet for everybody, if somebody says, yeah, every time I eat that Japanese hibachi, I get this pain, we might say, okay, stay away from the Japanese hibachi. It might solve your problem. Well, I mean... It's hard to. Maybe if it's not... Okay, that's not a good example. If they've got the good white sauce, yeah, if you it got might white, be yeah, worth you're the not, acid reflux. You're not going to not eat hibachi. <laughs> John, what do you think? Any other lifestyle um, modifications that we didn't mention? Giving yourself a good amount of time after you eat before sure. laying down. Um, obviously, you're going to know your body better than anybody else, but that's a thing. Yeah. Also, laying awkwardly in a position where your stomach can empty versus the other way where the esophagus and stomach line up um, can help a little bit too so sure I, I agree because I am one of the sufferers of occasional acid reflux and I noticed that it is worse if I've because I have a bad thing about eating right before bed so that's another thing they recommend try to avoid food within three hours of bedtime right and I also tend to sleep on my stomach every once in a while if I've got a full belly and the pressure of the bed's pushing on my stomach, 
I'm probably going to have a little bit of, of reflux. Um, they estimate about 10 to 20 percent of people in the Western world um, have somewhat uh, continuous acid reflux over time. That might be a little overestimated. Interestingly, Asian countries um, are a little bit lower, around the 5 percentile. Um, you might be able to associate that with what we eat, so diet is important. Um, but yeah, staying upright, I think they recommend, what, 30 to 60 minutes if yeah. that's really a, um, a consideration for you, can definitely help too. Or an astronaut bed, because that's an idea I just had. You know, the astronaut Zero beds, gravity? Zero gravity. Well, that would be helpful. Yeah, you would lay in this bed and just sleep upright like the astronauts do in space. Not quite as comfortable because we have gravity here, but sure. we could. I think we got you know, a good yeah. business model here. The GERD bed. Sure. And interestingly, avoiding tight-fitting garments hasn't really panned out to matter that much, but still a consideration, I yeah. think. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I mean, I'm an occasional sufferer myself, and a little bit of extra weight, tight shirt. Yoga, laying yoga down, pants. Yoga pants. But, you know, <laughs> accidentally buying the women's ones instead of the men's ones. I know how you like to roll. <laughs> um, you know, those, those the things. The yoga bod. Yeah. Yeah. Yoga grandpa bod. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Classic. Um, yeah, those, I mean, I think they're anecdotal. But, sure. Um, For sure. They but, matter. And it's individual, so they mm-hmm. matter to... Patient-specific. Yeah. yeah. And we're pharmacists. The common misconception is that we love meds, but that really couldn't be farther from the truth. We yeah. actually, if you don't need medication, we don't want you to be on medication because we know the issues that can arise from medication. Yes. So, you know, experiment, give it a try, encourage your patients to give it a try, um, even if they're overweight. And after that, what do we consider? So this is where the debate kind of lies, right? Because sure. we could start with starting off low with our most basic medication, our basic treatments, and then kind of work our way up to more um, efficacious but possibly uh, more adverse effect type medications. Um, or we can just start off with the big guns and then kind of de-escalate as necessary. Uh, and there's advantages and disadvantages to both. You know, obviously, if if you are starting off with the maximal therapy, you know, you're treating the GERD very quickly. You're getting the patient under control, getting them to have a better quality of life. However, you may be over-medicating, and the reality is we don't always de-escalate these medications right. when they get started. That's the problem. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, disadvantages to that are um, advantages to the the. Um, starting off slow with something like an antacid, you know, you're you're kind of finding that sweet spot of exactly how much therapy you need, but you're not, um, and you, you know, you don't overshoot it. But the patient has GERD lo- or their symptoms longer, and you know, it's just maybe a poorer quality of life. So I think it just, again, patient specific, like everything else, and it depends on you know how severe the symptoms are, how often they're having them, and more to go from there. Sure. And I tend to be an advocate more of the start low and go slow, mm-hmm. uh, especially in this disease state. So what are what are the goals of therapy? We mentioned quality of life. So we want patients to be able to eat and sleep uh, and not have issues with that. But also we want to avoid long-term complications of acid reflux, so weakening of the LES of the lower esophageal sphincter, mm-hmm. leading to erosive esophagitis, Barrett's esophagus, potentially esophageal cancer. So that's that's what we're trying to avoid. Um it might take a little while to get to that point. So if, if if we try lifestyle, let's give it a shot and see if the patient's motivated to fix that. If not, well, let's use an occasional antacid. Mm-hmm. See if that works. No, I, I didn't mention if the person has esophageal erosion. So if it's severe enough where they've actually had erosion, then they automatically sure. start on the maximal therapy. Sure. So you know the, what I was saying was whether you're kind of deciding which way to go is is if they do not have signs of esophageal erosion already. Right. So and how do we find figure that out? Endoscopy, so endoscopies. Right? Yeah, yeah, you can kind of uh, scope and see if there's been some changes in the the cell histology in the esophagus and see if. Um, you know, we're moving towards things like Barrett's or if a person has Barrett's esophagus. Right. And, uh, yeah, put them at risk. And aside from there being blood that somebody is spitting up or even in the stool, um, I doubt that's going to be like the first thing that a practitioner does is, oh, GERD symptoms, endoscopy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but if for whatever reason they had that and you said, yeah, you have some disruption of the mucosa down there, Barrett's esophagus, erosive of esophagitis, let's go PPI. Um, but yeah, otherwise, we could try an antacid. Um, if it's more than a few times a week and the antacid isn't really covering it, 
Um, next line might be an H2RA, so an antihistamine, um, a histamine 2 receptor antagonist. Uh, you could try that low dose once a day, see if it helps, um, and kind of go up from there, higher doses twice a day. And there are length of therapies for these before you consider moving up if that's the route that you want to take, right? Mm -hmm. And um, real quick, too, talking about antacids. So the typical products that we have available they either have calcium carbonate, mm -hmm. they have magnesium, um, or they have some sort of a uh, aluminum compound. Um, you know, those three are the ones that we typically see. They neutralize the, the gastric acid and uh, hopefully reduce the symptoms. So, you know, when we're thinking adverse effects, again, patient-specific, uh, with the aluminum-type products, we're thinking constipation, and then with magnesium, uh, we're thinking more of, like, diarrhea. So I think it needs to, if you are going to use antacids, looking at the patient's kind of comorbidities, seeing if they're on other medications. If a person's on, you know, chronic opioid therapy, we probably don't want to give them an aluminum-based uh, antacid. Right. That can probably make that constipation worse. And so I think, you know, that's one thing to keep in mind, um, as well as paying attention to their renal function as well. Sure, yeah. so aluminum, magnesium can accumulate it depending on how often they use. They taste delicious, and so I people know. can eat Just them like candy. Them. Yeah, Especially those fruit chews. Mm -hmm. It's like candy. Yep. Little calcium carbonate vitamins. Mm -hmm. But um, And something else that I actually came across very recently, Alka-Seltzer products. So the fruit chews I don't think do, but um, other ones potentially have aspirin. So, so Alka-Seltzer original. That's the one. That's the one that yeah, has it's, aspirin. It's okay. aspirin, and it's got um, sodium bicarb, but the sodium component of that, it's 500 milligrams of sodium. Whew. So you have that's, a, that's nothing. That's one pack of ramen. Okay. <laughs> right. That's like half a pack of ramen. Yeah. That's, that's, that's if you throw the packet of actual right. stuff away and eat the cracker. <laughs> so the uh, 500 milligrams of sodium, you know, that's something that if a patient is taking these multiple times a day, you know, if you have a, a CHF patient, sure. you may want to... Uh, avoid Alka-Seltzer original. Plus it's got aspirin in it, which is really right. kind of counterintuitive. And, to... you know, abdominal pain could be an ulcer. Mm -hmm. Aspirin's not really going to help with that. Yeah. Probably going to hurt it. Aspirin treatment for peptic ulcer disease. Yeah. It's, it's an emerging therapy. Not recommending that. <laughs> yeah, no. That's fine. So... I'll, I'll see you when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, the um, what about drug interactions with antacids? Because we don't always kind of sure. think about that. So, yeah, a lot to think about. Um, I, the big one I always think of is um, antiretrovirals. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really anything that has to do with like, an H2 blockers with those too. Right. Anything that suppressive, suppresses acid is a concern. Yeah. Other ones, anything that combine dye or trivalent cations. Mm -hmm. um, Tolerquinolones come to mind. Yeah. Tetra tetracyclines as well. That's a good um, recipe for C. diff. Yeah. Sure. Fluoroquinolones is the one I think it's more, more uh, common in. Um, you get the chelation and then the antibiotic doesn't work. Next thing you know, you have to take more antibiotics. Um, also, the I mean, the good thing about antacids is they have a very quick onset, but you know, and the duration doesn't last very long. So if you do have to take an antibiotic, but you're on an occasional antacid, you can still take them. It's not going to interact all day. So you just separate them by you know a good four hours or so, and usually the patient's good to go. Um, it's when you get into the longer acting agents that we may run into a little bit more of an issue. Yeah. So H2 blockers. Yeah. And um, I did want to mention something that isn't normally thought about with GERD, but there are surface acting agents like caraphate, sacrophate, mm -hmm. uh, that people have used. I don't know that I would really recommend it in our stepwise therapy, but yeah. um, technically it is an option. Te so. Yeah. I think I've seen it off label at that too. And so maybe I think, especially that's, have my, I usually think of that and they yeah. have to have ulcers as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've definitely seen that if the patient just cannot, for whatever reason, take a other medication. Yeah. So H two RAs might be where you go next. Um, like I said, there's low dose and standard dose. Um, if you start a low dose, you might try that for a few weeks, see if it's working. You know, two weeks is at least I think is reasonable. If it's not, you can increase the dose. Still do once a day for a couple weeks. If it's not working, you can go twice a day on the um, H two RAs. Some examples of those commonly you would see famotidine, ranitidine. Um, some of these are over the counter. Uh, other higher doses are behind the counter. There's also nizatidine and cimetidine, um, just for consideration, but famotidine, ranitidine going to be the most common. Uh, they can go twice a day. They have a pretty, they have a fairly quick onset of action, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Not as fast as an acid, of minutes, course. 30 minutes, 60 minutes. But so. 30 to 60 minutes, you could expect relief. 
Um, and then after a few weeks of that, if the patient is still having recurrent symptoms, that's when you would consider going up, right? Mm-hmm. Here's a quick question. See if you, because I, I don't know, I honestly don't know the answer to this. Does Adidane, is there a special, I saw that the other day for the first time in forever. Is there a special reason that you guys know of why that one would work better in some kind of a comorbidity? So apparently that's OTC. I, I've heard, I mean, I, and I've, I've dispensed it as a medic, like actual prescription, but I just hadn't seen it probably since I've been practicing. I have no, yeah, idea. I, I, I have no idea. I meant to look that up and I forgot. You would need somebody older than me probably. It, I, I figure it's an older one. Yeah, it, I think so too. Yeah. Um, man. I need and, to see some metadine either, you know, yeah. the drug interactions. Yeah, yeah, they, exactly. Yeah. Just metadine sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, the other thing to consider too, um, the ranitidine and the famotidine are both available over the counter, but there are prescription only strengths yeah. available. So 40 milligrams of famotidine is still prescription only, and then 300 milligrams of ranitidine. So, you know, the other thing is a lot of these times we can actually get those medications covered if we fill it as a prescription, um, even though they are over the counter. So I would even recommend um, as a provider writing the prescription, even if you want them on like 150 milligrams of vernitidine Mm -hmm. and giving them a prescription and letting them at least try to get their insurance to pay for it. Um, A lot of times we will because we can buy large, large quantities of it. And so it's a decreased price for the insurance companies that will let it go through. Sure. Sure. And even if uh, your insurance company isn't going to pay for it, um, getting that prescription will allow your uh, health savings account or your flex spend yeah, to be able to use that. Yeah, card. that's a good point. Because so. some pay for OTCs, but not a lot don't. Right. Sure. Well, even so. if you, we could even run it as a cash prescription, and then really, then we can definitely use the yeah. health savings. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's a good point. It's good. We always got to think about the. Way, I think too many people uh, in healthcare don't think about the financial aspect right. of it that doesn't always it's always like our last thought but yeah. if they can't pay for it change the, the whole the whole visit everything is useless if they can't pay for the medication right so. and the other thing i do I, i'm a fan of is the uh the combo so pepsid complete is famotidine along with uh, calcium carbonate and magnesium hydroxide so you know you get the the antacid aspect which is very very quick acting um, you know, that starts to work, and by the time it starts to wear off, the famotidine is kind of kicking in. So that's a really good kind of PRN. Mm-hmm. Um, or if, you know, you, you're going to eat pizza and you know that's what does it for you, you know, take it before your meal, and hopefully by the end it, it's controlling your symptoms. So know that that's available. It's generic as well, so it's pretty pretty cheap, um, but that's a, a good option. Yeah, um, for sure. And I, I do think it's important to mention, especially with or only with the H2RAs, um, tachyphylaxis yes, is a concern. Yes, good, good. So tachyphylaxis is basically where a drug has diminishing effect as you use it long term. Um, the timeline for that is about two to six weeks for H2RAs. So that's a consideration. After a few weeks of using this consistently, it really might not work. And so that kind of goes to the point that I don't think we've addressed thoroughly yet. But um, the idea behind GERD treatment is to reassess symptoms after a period of time um, and look into coming off the medication. And so even though you push lifestyle at first, lifestyle still needs to be a consideration throughout the duration of drug therapy uh, so that they can eventually come off these medications because, like we said, they're not necessarily benign, right? Right. Um, you know, the other thing, too, with H2 blockers is the, the risk of causing confusion in elderly patients. Mm-hmm. Um, John, maybe you can talk about this a little bit, but have you seen any with that as far as uh, inpatient um, have you seen patients that are obviously delirious from being in, uh, you know, the ICU or something like that, and and then also being on ranitidine with their, you know, absolutely, um, you know, altered mental status. The differential for that is, you know, pages long, and that's one of the first things I look at is what drugs they're on to mm-hmm. see if there's any play in that, in addition to whatever their other symptoms are, um, just to try to rule it out. You know, it's it's a good thing to. Um, kind of go over you know that beers criteria for mm-hmm. the elderly and that's what that's all about so um, those are definitely consideration and in there for um, I look at I mean and yes I do that on a daily basis in the ICU try to figure out is there delirium mm-hmm. from the ICU or from one of the drugs or both sure and you know Right. And increasing that risk other than just being elderly, right. it's going to be renal impairment. So sure. it can accumulate right. uh, another consideration with these H2RAs. So definitely think about the drugs. Always. Yes. Yeah. Always, always. Said the pharmacist. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so mm-hmm. we mentioned um, now, and y'all can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, famotidine, from what I've read, actually is one of the agents kind of like, and it just kind of applies just to this, just to famotidine, but um, QT prolongation is more prevalent with famotidine, um, whereas it's not really a concern necessarily with the other ones. Have you seen that at all? I've seen a couple uh, things in the literature that talked about that. Yeah, absolutely. It's on my short list of is things. Um, Renitidine's on there too. Pretty much anything that's in the gut. Um, I know we're not talking about it, but the, you know, anti-nausea. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Zofran's the other yeah, one Zofran's that happens, on my list. people don't think about. Um, I'll see a, you know, Leviquin-Zofran mm-hmm. combo or levoquin famotidine combo, and that's a that's a trigger for me. And other antihistamines like Atarax, yeah, along the QTC, hydroxazine, yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, pretty much anything that's CNS and, you know, gut's falling in there. So mm-hmm. um, anything in that realm is triggering a look for me. Right. Yeah. And other considerations with uh, something that's going to lower the gastric pH if you're having QTC prolongation, not too much of a concern if your electrolytes are okay, but if sure. you're lowering the pH, affecting absorption of electrolytes, might throw those out of whack, and that's when the QTC becomes an issue because yeah. you're at higher risk for an arrhythmia. Yeah, and I mean, patient comes in with low mag. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So I mean, you, you, get, you get the mm-hmm. elderly coming in with a little bit of you know urosepsis and some altered mental status, and they're dehydrated. I mean, your electrolytes are off, your QT is prolonged, you know, maybe they've got some home meds. Um, the general idea and what I've picked up from our cardiologist is you want to keep that potassium right around four, four yeah. and mag around two mm-hmm. um, just to help out and never really hurts to give a little extra mag you don't want it too high but i mean that's the treatment for what you're trying to prevent anyway and it's right. hard to get it too high honestly yeah so yeah and most most of the time people are malnourished and having a deficiency in it yeah. anyway so yeah. sure and that's it's something i think a lot of people don't don't think about too is if your potassium is low you supplement potassium right and it doesn't go up get a mag yep. <laughs> yeah i i i order mag all the time we we have uh, protocols where I am to monitor drugs. This is the this is the beauty of inpatient is with our protocols in place. I can monitor any drug that they're on. Well, they're on this drug, so I can monitor this. They're they're on a drug to pretty much. I could order any test anytime, and it's mm-hmm. it's justified. Yeah. Um. Most of the time I don't need to, but I'll I'll order a mag, um, if necessary. Not a problem. So. That's cool. Yeah. We should do a podcast on electrolyte disorders. Oh, or at least done. take one. Yeah, we can do a series. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Let's do it. We'll do I, 15 I have, podcasts have plenty, on it. I have plenty of cases on electrolyte disorders yeah. from... Sweet. That'd be awesome. Alcohol withdrawal. Oh, yeah. It's just rampant. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. We can do that. See? We're, awesome. We're, now you guys get a little taste of our world of planning for our podcast that's, <laughs> that's how, how it goes do it. we talk we go yeah that's a good idea let's do that and so you got sit a topic down and we start yeah. recording <laughs> right exactly there you go all right so uh also too i want to mention with some metadine since i just blinkingly said it sucks um it, they do have some <laughs> side effects with uh some metadine that are a little bit more um severe i guess you could say so things like gynecomastia impotence um more severe side effects and then like uh, what cole was saying with the drug drug interactions um it's a moderate inhibitor of 2c19 and then a weak inhibitor of 3a4 and 1a2 so drug interactions are something that we need to consider with cimetidine and as far as i'm concerned it's, there's just better options than the available now so yeah i don't I mean it. i don't see it on anybody's formulary that i deal yeah. with of the multiple hospitals mm-hmm. so yeah yeah. Why take the risk? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. All right. Let's talk PPIs. Let's talk Everyone's PPIs. favorite. Burnt coming in for a landing with uh, probably the most controversial, I'd say, in the last couple of years, right? Yeah, probably. Yeah. So, what is a PPI, Mike? PPI. It stands for proton pump inhibitor. inducer. Oh, oh man. shoot. Yeah. Got that wrong. Failed. So, basically, what this does is where an H2 blocker will reversibly bind to you know the parietal cells they the ppis actually irreversibly bind um and they're they're blocking the proton potassium atpase um on the parietal cells you're you're forming this like disulfide bond between cysteines and and it's a irreversible bond so your your body has to actually produce more pumps in order to 
you know, create those pumps again. You're not going to have the medication leave and then they start back up. You actually have to produce more. So yeah. that's why they're so much more effective than the others. Right. Um, you know, the, the big thing though is I, I guess the, the biggest issue with, with PPIs is besides the adverse effects and all that is actually how people need to take them. Right. And that's what gets confused so often. <laughs> Very common confusion. Um, what do you, John, in your you know, experience, how many people do you talk to or do you counsel, like, as they're a discharge counseling, or do you talk about, you know, if you ask them about their PPI, just know exactly how they're supposed to take it? Right. I mean, th- this goes blanket for every ed- medication when they come in and get their uh, med history done by our uh, technicians. And we go through it. I mean, I, I just kind of look at adherence and the way they're taking things immediately is why you're here. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, you'd be amazed at how many people don't take it correctly. Um, just and, and the, some of the providers are not aware either. So, I mean, right. education, again, is where we have a chance to step in and, you know, help our patients out a sure. lot. So um, another thing is how fast they're supposed to work you talked about that irreversible binding right Mm -hmm. and um you know the turnover of those parietal cells anybody have an idea what that is so as far as like your body reproduce like yeah so it's about 20 percent a day is how much they can actually produce right and make again so you're looking at like five to seven days for a full turnover yeah three to seven probably somewhere maybe a little bit sooner so so that's your uh kind of like your onset as well Mm -hmm. so you're not going to have your patient immediately yeah, definitely a few days at yeah. least. And so, I mean, we talk about this in uh, self-care class in uh, pharmacy school, um, having them on a H2 blocker in addition or a, you know, um, calcium. Yeah, you know, giving them some um, antacid, antacid to get that's through That's the it. word I'm looking for. There you go. Um, to, you know, start them out and double up. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I mean, people just aren't. Yeah, Is, and I think the importance should be emphasized the H2RA or the antacid is for the interim. Yes. So mm-hmm. once they get stable on the PPI, um, they're supposed to come off of that. Also, uh, most of the other agents we've talked about can be PRN. PPIs right. work best if you use them consistently every day. Right. And I think the biggest just counseling point about how to take it um, is 30 to 60 minutes before the biggest meal of the day. So a lot of times when the prescription comes through, it's uh, take one QAM, so take one in the morning. Um, if a patient doesn't eat breakfast, right. they're going to take that PPI within an hour. Um, it's uh, basically going to be out of your system effectively because it was never activated. Um, and when they eat four hours later, they're not going to get the effect. Right. So I think the biggest meal of a day of the day, I didn't come up with that. You know, obviously somebody told me that is a good um, recommendation. So if they don't eat until lunch, if they eat one big meal in a day, 30 to 60 minutes before that to have access to the most parietal cells, um, consistently every day uh, and that's going to give you the best results yeah right. and then, well that's the thing that people don't realize and i ask a lot of students this i'm like well what's the half-life of a bpi everyone assumes it's 24 hours because they say like on the box you know 24 hour medication so it's only 24 hours if it's working right. uh, the effects last 24 hours potentially uh you know the actual half-life of a ppi is usually about an hour sometimes you can stretch it to two depending on the agent but well, around an hour is where we think of so like cole was saying you take that medication on an empty stomach and then don't eat for four or five more hours or sometimes i see him taking it at bedtime yeah you know, no actually I, I see that very commonly because uh-huh. oh i'm having my my acid reflux at bedtime okay well here's the ppi take it you know right two hours you after you eat right before bed and yeah exactly right. and a, a discussion i had with a surgeon this past week um, kind of brought to light the reason why and so i'll go ahead and explain that yeah, mechanistically sure. um you know while you you take it it's got to go through the stomach every single ppi is delayed release mm-hmm. it changes upon except for zegarid they Sorry. use the sodium bicarb i just i just want to make sure there's that one nerd's gonna be in the audience like uh-uh zegarid's not <laughs> i got him True. yeah the, <laughs> these guys are idiots <laughs> right and i mean that goes along with zegarid is the right the sodium bicarb being, yeah is the point of the delayed release is triggered by right. change in ph mm-hmm. in your gut right and so it needs to get through the stomach and then be absorbed and then when you eat that half an hour hour later it's triggering the activation of those parietal cells which is actually the when it can stop the action if yeah. they don't get activated right it, it's ha- not, it has it's to not, bind to the actual work. activated atpases right 
which are not activated when you're not eating. Correct. <laughs> or most of them are not anyway. Right. Sure. So some other things about PPIs. So there's some common ones. Omeprazole, ezomeprazole. Oh, sorry, we're not done. I was going to say, well, did I, you want to elaborate actually, on that? Yeah, Go actually, ahead. there was a couple of things. In addition to eating, if you if you eat, like we were talking about, if you do this during breakfast and people think, oh, no problem, I, I eat, you know, toast, coffee, whatever. Mm-hmm. What's the pH of your coffee? It's super acidic. Yeah. Um, so that is not going to help. So right. drinking cola, coffee with your PPI is not going to give it that activating. Well, and you want to activate as many... Per, like of the ATP right. as possible. So the more, you know, the, the bigger the meal, at least to my understanding, the, right. then you will get more activation of more pumps. So it gives you a better target for the, because you're not going to be able to shut all of them off and not all of them get activated with every meal anyway. Right. And so the more you can turn on, the more you have a shot at turning them off. So after about three or four days, you kind of beat the 20% turnover and end up suppressing it. So yeah, yeah t- taking it with your coffee in the morning it's probably just getting dissolved and they're activated in the stomach and never actually getting absorbed. Which might, you know, the coffee and cola might actually be exacerbating their GERD anyway, so. Yeah. <laughs> or just keeping them awake. Right. <laughs> yeah, a lot of factors. Um, Cole, what were you starting to say, though, about omeprazole? Yeah, I was just going to say the common one. So omeprazole, as omeprazole are common, both um, over-the-counter as Prilosec and Nexium OTC. Also, uh, pantoprazole, Protonix is common. Lansoprazole, you'll see that every once in a while. There's also Dexlansoprazole, so there's something kind of special about that one, right? Yeah. So that that one, you know, when it first came out, I was just kind of wasn't a huge fan, just because I, I didn't really read up much on it when it first came out, and I I kind of looked at it as just a, a me too PPI, and uh, you know it's a lot more expensive than the other one, so I wasn't a big fan. Um, however, if you have a patient, and I'll, I'll put my wife in the spot. I'm sure she wouldn't mind. I didn't ask her, but <laughs> it was over five bucks. Never yeah, yeah. So, you never do until afterwards. So you know, I, I with her, she's a pharmacist, and so her her meal schedule is completely all over the place, if at all. Uh, and so she would she has problems with this, where she has to take um, a PPI pretty regularly, and um, she's tried weaning off and other things, but usually end up, end up having to go back on it at some point. Um, and so she would take her Nexium and then forget to eat or would get caught up, you know, caught in something at work and couldn't eat. And so she just never could get it under control. So Dexalant is actually not um, dependent on meal time, you know, a- activation of those um, ATPases. And so Dexalant actually can still bind pretty effectively um, to those those uh, ATPases, um, even with that, without regards to food at all. And so for her, she started taking the Dexalant and Im- immediately took care of, of her acid reflux. Yeah. Um, and now it's almost completely controlled. So that one is definitely not just a me too. There is definitely a, maybe a niche market, but it's definitely something to consider if you have a patient that has a, a weird work schedule or um, medical professionals 100%. Um, and it is expensive. It's brand name only, but the company is usually pretty good about a uh, generic, um, or not a generic. I'm sorry, a uh, manufacturer's coupon. And so I think for her, like, Grant, we have insurance. But um, after it goes through, she gets a 90 day supply for like five bucks after that discount card. Jeez. So it's wow. very doable if you have insurance and you have a patient that's, um, you know, their copay maybe even a little bit too high. You can get them covered. And they actually rolled her uh, coupon over. From one year, it like expired, and they just gave her a fresh one, and it lasted another year. So, nice. awesome. It's definitely definitely an option to keep, to uh, consider. Yeah, and there's also rebeprazole, which isn't used as often, but um, still, for the sake of completion. Yeah, good, cool. What about risk factors? Yeah, so let's let's talk um, quickly about how to use it in some of potential issues. So that's why it's controversial, right? right. Um, so, like we said, PPIs are commonly the first thing that are thrown at a patient. Um, but we've kind of gone through a stepwise approach to GERD potentially, something to consider. Uh, once you get to this point where they're still having frequent symptoms, they're having severe GERD that's impairing their quality of life, they're waking up even with the high dose twice daily H2RAs and maybe even some breakthrough Tums or something like that, um, that's when you might consider this. Or if within that period uh, you've gotten an endoscopy, they have um, PUD, they have um, a rose of esophagitis that have Barry's esophagus, then they would need a PPI. So you go ahead and start it. You give them all these counseling points. Um, it's not the end of the story. So frequently, patients are left on this uh, long-term 
for their whole life potentially. Um, but really after a couple months, you can reassess. So if they've been asymptomatic for a couple of months and they come back into you and everything's going great, you say, well, good. Well, let's see about getting you off of this PPI um, because there are some long-term complications that we'll talk about in a second uh, as far as getting them off. So we talked about how uh, your stomach is going to more or less overcompensate um, for the lack of acid. Um, and so PPIs are one where you don't necessarily want to just discontinue abruptly, especially if you've been on it for longer than six months, which, like we said, hopefully you're reassessing at the two-month mark. Um, either way, just to be safe, you're going to say, well, let's give you a trial off of this PPI. Um, if you discontinue abruptly and they have rebound um, acid reflux, and they're going to say, no, 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 it didn't work, I need that, and so you might restart it. Um, so a taper is something you can definitely consider with the PPIs and hopefully will decrease risk of that rebound. And, and patients that do have that rebound um, acid reflux symptoms, I mean, they a lot of times they'll describe it as like the worst right guard that they've had or worst symptoms that they've had in their lives because i like i always think about it like your body's you know has this thing that it's trying it thinks it needs to make these atpases you're blocking that so it's trying to comp overcompensate it's trying super hard it's like water pushing against a dam and all of a sudden the dam just disappears and except in nice cooling water you get stomach acid right <laughs> basically the same thing it's, yeah it's it's i'll work on it <laughs> Yeah, so if, if there's anything else you take away from this, um, not the PPIs are totally evil, not, you know, anti-PPI or anything, um, but yeah, there's... Because a, they're a medicine and they can't have an right, agenda, obviously. Right, exactly. Um, but there's there's a time and a place um, and reassess. So if, if, if they've been on it a while and they're doing okay, we might be able to get them off this and um, reduce some of these long-term complications, so... Uh, as far as complications, so there's a lot of um, discussion these days about what PPIs are actually um, going to do as far as harm. Um, a lot of things make sense, like yeah, you you might uh, you're changing the pH in the stomach, so you might decrease absorption of certain um, nutrients, certain vitamins, and whatnot. Um, I have a pretty good made analysis from um, last year, and um, I'd like to post it on the website if I can. Um, but it kind of breaks down a lot of the available data with PPIs. Um, a lot of uh, things they identify are just correlations because there hasn't been anything randomized controlled to look specifically at safety with PPIs, especially long term. And this meta analysis is specifically in elderly patients. So that's where you get a lot of these concerns from. Um, so they looked at six um, issues that can arise specifically. Um, like I said, it's all correlation, but within the correlation, they actually give specific risk. Um, assessments for those. So one is fractures, uh, which makes sense because if we're potentially decreasing the absorption of calcium um, long term, that could be an issue. They associate it with that. They associate it with an increased risk of falls with PPIs. And they say you have a, uh, potentially a 25 to 50 percent increased risk of a fracture uh, if you're on a PPI long term as an elderly patient. So that's pretty significant, especially if it's a hip fracture. Um, and you fall. And you fall. That's how the falls happen. Exactly. Um, there's high oh. mortality rates in elderly patients. I think specifically over 75 who have hip fractures within the first three, six month period, even a year after high mortality rates. So that's, that's very significant. Um, as well, you can have an increased risk for C. diff. So they say, um, in this study, at least about a twofold increased risk for C. diff or, um, C. diff associated diarrhea, um, and about one and a half fold increased risk for recurrent C. diff. Um, so that kind of makes sense. Um, maybe in the, I guess if you're decreasing the acidity of the stomach, um, you're more or less taking away your natural barrier against C. diff, which is already, um, a hardy bacteria already. Right. Um, so it's going to increase that risk and there's a lot of associated electrolyte abnormalities, um, and morbidity and mortality that can potentially come from that. Um, along with nosocomial infections and those sorts of things. So on that same vein, increased risk for CAP, community-acquired pneumonia. They identify a 30% increased risk for similar reasons. Um, vitamin B12 deficiency. Um, this study doesn't specifically talk about magnesium, but that's also a consideration. But they say um, you have an 80% increased risk for vitamin B12 deficiency. Um, so that's pretty significant. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, CKD and dementia, there's less data um, directly supporting those, um, but they uh, postulate that there could be an increased risk for 
acute interstitial nephritis leading to chronic interstitial nephritis leading to CKD. Um, and then with dementia, um, they associate a 40% increased risk in this. There was like two small cohort studies, but um, still that's a consideration in the elderly population. And there was, there was a uh, systematic review um, from the Journal of Gastroenterology and um, uh, Hepatology um, that kind of looked at that as well. They, one of the things they said that was um, the dementia case is a little bit limited to the way the studies were set up um, and the results are really conflicting. So that's one that I think definitely needs to be studied. Sure. Um, that was from 2017, and there's a couple others. Uh, there was one from the Nurses Health Study 2. Um, they took data from that, and they didn't see a increased risk in that particular patient population um, that they studied, and they didn't see an increase in dementia. So it is one thing that you know I, I think that we need to take into consideration, especially if there uh, are other risk factors, or if they have family history of dementia or Alzheimer's. But you know, I think that uh, that is definitely one we need to keep looking at. And if you have a patient that definitely needs to be on a PPI, maybe they have a uh, you know peptic ulcer disease, and they need to have you know, some healing from that. Um, I think that it is also good to talk to them about the, if they read about dementia on the internet or whatever, um, having that conversation with them and just, you know, talking about whether or not it's actually a real risk. And cause you know, I'm, I'm a hundred percent on board with like with what Cole said, as far as, you, you know, the, the side effects, they're definitely real. There's a ton of them, um, long-term, but we also have to there are patients that really do genuinely need these. So I think talking to them about some of the more scary ones like dementia or MI, you know, are things that we need to also consider. Right. Yeah. And adding in that reassessment that you mentioned earlier. Sure. Uh, yeah. Did we say, I mean, initially PPIs, I don't, I don't know if you said this already, Cole, but um, PPIs originally, you know, they, they said eight weeks was the yes. training. You know, you said a couple months, but that's like, that's the reason like Prolisac comes in the package right. sizes that I it does. Right. I say that, yeah. um, you know, it was never intended to be used to be for used. more than eight weeks. Yeah. 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 Um, even for peptic ulcer disease, you know, healing, they'll, a lot of times they'll say eight weeks of PBI treatment is enough to heal it. Right. And, and some, sometimes even staying on the inset, if the patient has to be on inset with the PBI, it, eight weeks is still enough to heal, heal it with, for an inset induced, um, peptic ulcer disease. That's, yeah. And if you're taking, trying to take a patient off, um, they don't say, you know, wait a week. And if they have symptoms, restart them. They say, wait a couple months and mm -hmm. see how it's going. Um, before you consider restarting. And like I said, all these adverse events are just correlations at this point, um, but you know they're significant. And if there's gonna put a patient at increased risk of harm, and they don't necessarily need it, like you said, reassess. Yeah, and this is totally random, but one thing that I was, you know, always consider is as far as, is in regards to the B12 deficiency, um, Patients that are, uh, you know, patients with diabetes and they're yeah. on metformin. Yeah. So <laughs> type 2 diabetics that are on um, metformin long term, that, that depletes intrinsic factor, which obviously lowers the body's ability to absorb B12. And so if you see a patient that's on long term PPI and long term metformin, and then all of a sudden their endocrinologist is starting them on Lyrica because they're right. having some neuropathy, maybe you need to get a B12 level. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So when some, they fall and break their hip and come into the hospital. It's a good time to assess all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> just, hand, just handle everything in one visit. But, I mean, that's pretty much how they end up there. It's perfect. Yeah. People are really healthy, and then they you know, take a step, have that fall, and then that's why that morbidity and mortality rate is really high is because everything seems like it's okay, and mm -hmm. then that one little thing will trigger yep. all of those things to come to fruition and kind of come to light. They're there in the background. Yeah, I was going to say, that's yeah. more of it. No, yeah. I'm fine. I feel yeah. fine. Yeah, they feel fine. They think they're fine, yeah. and it manifests. And we referenced the beers list earlier, which a lot of people more or less scoff at because of how strict they are, but there's a reason um, that yeah. they're so strict because we're trying to prevent those falls in the elderly patients. Yeah, it's, so. I mean, it's not a don't, don't give them that medication. It's assess their right. need for that mm -hmm. medication, exactly. which we should be doing anyway, but right. especially in the elderly population where altered mental status has again that differential diagnosis a mile long so yeah. yeah good stuff cool yeah cool anything else we want to talk about that's all i got right on anything else john i'm good all right <laughs> john's like, i'm so bored i've been sitting here for <laughs> over an hour yeah i don't i don't normally sit this what long. are you guys doing no yeah, I gotta go to bed. Yeah, yeah. It's like seven. you're a resident now, so yeah. Can you, you gotta hit the hay early. No, you... uh, no, not yet. 
No, okay. Not until July. Yeah, two Got a little while before you're back to residency. Yeah. Yeah. No. Still look like a pharmacist for for now. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We'll, uh, we'll we'll try to have you on again for uh, maybe an electrolyte imbalance then before yeah. you awesome. before you leave, and then we'll send you off. That works. Cool. Properly. Have, yeah. a, have a ceremony. There you <laughs> go. Send you on your way. All right. Cool. All right. Thanks for listening, you guys. We will see you next time.